Everyone's had something to eat. You're all back from lunch. Um, just to make sure you all know where you are, this is the Games Mini Conf. Woo! Woo. Uh, so we're back now. Uh, so we've got three talks to this session, followed by a play session. We've got Paul, we've got Ducky, and we have Leon. Uh, so we're starting off with Paul. Paul's going to be talking about fan fiction. For those of you who don't know Paul, Paul has never given a talk before in his life. Um, <laughs> he is completely just nervous, so I think you should all join me in giving him a round of applause, and we'll hand it straight over to Paul. Okay, hello Linux Conf you. Uh, hello people on the internet if we're streaming. Just a quick check, is my microphone working? Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent, wonderful. So thank you all so very much for coming here today. Um, I'm here to talk about changing the world through fan fiction. Uh, now there is a very, very small warning down here. Uh, this talk does contain scenes of animated violence and some really terrible puns. So I am sorry about that. So I'm talking about this because I love fiction. Um, when I was growing up, I spent most of my time uh, in books and video games and to a lesser extent movies and everything. And I had this incredibly active imagination. And consuming fiction really helped spark me thinking about what I could do and what worlds possibly could exist. And one of the things I didn't realise until much, much later when I grew up is that very often fiction isn't just telling a story, it's giving us new ways to think. And we see this a lot with, with a lot of modern fiction. Um, the Matrix was a fairly big deal because a lot of people who never thought about the idea that we might be inside a simulation suddenly thought about that idea. Uh, Westworld has been absolutely fantastic. Westworld has gone through a couple of reboots and every time it has people think about what makes somebody a person versus just a machine. And you end up some, with some really good discussions from that. And I love the subversiveness of this, because very often we give people entertainment and what we're secretly doing under the hood is giving them new ideas. And if I ever recommend a book to you, usually it's not, hey, I think this book is fantastic, it's I think this book has some concepts which I think that you might enjoy. So one of my most common books which I ask people if they've read is this wonderful book called Blind Sight. And Blind Sight is not the best science fiction story in the world, but it does an amazing job of examining intelligence and consciousness and asking, are they the same things or are they entirely separate things? And it examines that in a very, very good way. But I'm really here because I want to talk about fan fiction. And a lot of the fiction that I recommend to people actually is fan fiction or originated from fan fiction. And there's some good reasons for that. One reason is because fan fiction has this incredibly low barrier to entry. Rather than writing you know, a serious novel or producing a serious work, pretty much anyone can write some fan fiction in some form, put it up on the internet, share it with their friends. Now that means you end up with some sort of very amazing whimsical works, um, like Cat Max Furry Road, uh, which of course is a Neko Atsume Mad Max mashup, which is fantastic. Um, but you also end up with some more really interesting serious works as well. And one of the reasons I love fan fiction is that you can take non-mainstream ideas and you can pitch them to very specific audiences, so you don't need to be available to everyone, and you can leverage existing worlds. And this is hugely important. You don't have to build the entirety of Hogwarts to explore your idea. You can use these existing characters that people are already familiar with and you can get to your point much, much faster. So one piece of fan fiction which I've recommended to many people is The Last Ring Bearer. This is set in the Lord of the Rings world and it's the story of the War of the Ring from Mordor's perspective. And it in fact revolves around this idea that winners are the ones who write history. The War of the Ring was won by Gondor. So in this alternate account, you have this situation where Mordor is this more technologically advanced civilization. They are going through the process of industrialization and Gondor finds that to be incredibly threatening because they are the dominant power in that region and they know they will lose that if Mordor successfully industrializes. So they engage in warfare with Mordor and of course what happens when you start a war, you have a propaganda campaign. And one thing which happens is you vilify the enemy. You try to show them as being less than human. And so in The Last Ring Bearer, the term orc 
doesn't refer to someone who is non-human, the, the residents of Mordor are human, it's a racial slur which is used to vilify those people, to justify going to war against them. So it's a pretty amazing book in terms of its premise. Um, I didn't actually like the last two-thirds of the book, but I think the first third is absolutely brilliant, and I recommend people read it just for that first third. Another piece of fan fiction that I routinely recommend to people, uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Optimal. And um, this is a story about a super intelligent AI that originally runs a My Little Pony MMO, and it takes over the world using friendship and ponies. And it's not exactly a dystopia. It does take over the world, but the AI wants you to be happy. And it's not exactly a utopia either, because that friendship and ponies part is absolutely non-negotiable part of its programming. <laughs> You will, be friendly, you will be happy, but it must involve friendship and ponies. And so it's a pretty good read to look at, you know, uh, to explore the ideas of what might happen if we have a super intelligent AI, how that original programming may affect the end outcomes. But one of the reasons that I recommend it is because there is fan fiction on the fan fiction. <laughs> friendship is optimal, Calum est conterrans, or heaven is terrifying, is, I kid you not, one of the best discussions on the nature of consciousness that I have ever read. And consciousness is my jam. It's what I spend so much time thinking about. There is also, some of you may have read, uh, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. This is now finally finished. Uh, this is an enormous book. It's hundreds of chapters long. Um, but it's also one of the key books that made me really think about the ways in which I think. And if you happen to be a Harry Potter fan, it's got some absolutely delightful moments in it as well. So these are all ideas, these are all uh, books and works of fiction about ideas, ways in which we can think. The other thing which fiction gives us and which fan fiction gives us is stories about how we can live. And this is really important when it comes to shaping society because our media that we consume, the fiction that we consume, tells us what is normal. So when game developer Barbie came out, that was a pretty big deal because it says, hey, Barbie can write games and can write code, and Barbie is this role model. It's normalizing this as a career path. Um, when Ghostbusters came out, that was fantastic. It said, hey, if you've found uh, definitive evidence of the afterlife, you can totally monetize that into a successful startup. <laughs> and there's lots of other fiction out there as well. And one piece of fiction that I am very, very appreciative of is Steven Universe, which I'm sure from the, I can see a few nods in the audience, some of you have encountered. Uh, Steven Universe is aimed at preteens, which is very, very important. It's aimed at younger people. And it has very, very diverse stories in it. Um, it has diverse family configurations. It has healthy relationships. It has unhealthy relationships. It has an incredibly diverse range of characters. And it even talks about things like consent in a very, very healthy way. It also, much to my detriment, has some absolutely rocking tunes which will get stuck in your head and you will never stop listening to remixes. <laughs> so Steven Universe is great, um, but a lot of the fiction which we see is not always healthy. And in fact, it's rather terrifying if you go back and look at old movies or look at old fairy tales with some of the stuff which is in there. Sleeping Beauty teaches us that it's totally fine to kiss strangers as long as they're unconscious. <laughs> that is not a good message to be teaching anyone. Cinderella teaches you that, hey, if you've got an abusive family, you can leave them by getting married. There's probably better ways to resolve that situation. And Iron Man says that you can be a total utter jerk to everyone as long as you're rich. And one of the most commonly seen tropes in fiction is an unhealthy romance. This is absolutely prevalent throughout historical fiction and especially modern fiction as well. And so at this point, I'm going to do a brief detour uh, through uh, relational psychology and a particular section called attachment theory. Now, uh, put very simply, about 70% of relationships fall into, or 70% of relationship styles, fall into one of four broad categories. And I, I won't have time to discuss them all. Um, but one of those categories is known as, uh, as anxious preoccupied. 
Uh, these are people who tend to worry a lot about the relationship that they're in. Is that relationship working out okay? Um, is their partner, do this, does their partner really love them? They want to spend lots of time with their partner. They tend to come across as clingy. And the opposite of that is this attachment style known as dismissive avoidant. And these people tend to be uh, sort of uh, very independent. They don't like to rely upon others. They don't really like to express their feelings. Um, they really want to have that independence. They don't want to be worrying about their partner as it, as it happens to be. And if you think of these two styles, they would make an absolute terrible pairing. Because you've got one person who's always anxious about the relationship and the other one who really doesn't want to, to think about the relationship much at all. And you put them together, it's a terrible, terrible pairing. And yet, if you study the relationships which exist and which persist, which are stable for a long time, you find this is extremely common. And you also find that it is highly associated with gender roles when it comes to fiction. So let's look at some examples of where we see that. Twilight. Some of you might have encountered this. Um, Bella is 17 years old and she wants to get married and she spends a lot of time worrying about the relationship. Edward is 109 years old and he has, quote, never felt the need to fall in love. And he's pretending to be a high school student in order to pick up. This is not a healthy relationship. They should not be together. And some of the other fiction which we see in a similar genre is really not that much better. <laughs> Interesting side note, Fifty Shades of Grey started as a Twilight fan fiction. And why am I making a point of all this? Well, if you see these same ideas again and again, that normalises them. If we see these same things in fiction again and again, we go, oh, that's the way the world is supposed to be. And likewise, if we see ideas, or if we never see ideas, we can regard those as abnormal. If you never see a particular type of relationship and you encounter that, you might go, oh, that's really weird. And there may be judgment associated with that. And this has been a problem. The fact that we have not had diverse relationship representation has almost certainly resulted in Australia lagging behind the rest of the world when it came to things like marriage equality. It's also why when you see games like Dream Daddy, they have been such an enormous hit. Dream Daddy was a big deal. It sold a lot of games. It got a lot of attention. And it's because it showed relationships which were not being portrayed and people that were not being portrayed in traditional games. And in fact, there is a wonderful website called Queerly Represent Me, which tracks queer video games and looks at what happens in them and has articles, and I will absolutely fall into this for days, given the chance. The other thing which I want to note is fan fiction is crucial if we want to get diverse representation in mainstream media. And one of the reasons it comes back to that low barrier of entry which we have. So remember that we can take non-mainstream ideas and we can pitch them to small, narrow audiences. Well, fan fiction pretty much pioneers representation of relationships, of people, of ideas. To take a case study, Black Hermione Granger. It was very clear that J.K. Rowling did not write Hermione as a black character. This is something which came out of fan fiction and then was very popularised by that fan fiction. And J.K. Rowling points out that her depictions of, uh, of, of Hermione were not incompatible with having a black character. Brown eyes, frizzly hair and very clever. White skin was never specified. Rowling loves black Hermione. And in fact, this resulted in the casting of Noma Dumas Wenzi in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which caused the internet to blow up for some reason. Who would have expected? But this shows you that it is essential that you have fan fiction because that can actually influence the beliefs and ideas of the original authors. That can change canon. It's also very important when you look at who writes fan fiction. So there was a study done on Archive of Our Own, which is a popular fan fiction site a few years ago. And you can see from this chart that most fan fiction was written by women. In fact, it would be, it'd be correct to say the vast majority of fan fiction is written by non-men, 
we had twice as many non-binary people as men writing fan fiction on AO3. And yet, when we think about fan fiction, there's something which you'll encounter often, and that is that it's highly stigmatised. When I talk to people about fan fiction, when I give them fan fiction recommendations, they, they sort of give me this, this ridicule first, and then they're like, wait, are you serious? Do you really mean to be rec recommending like a My Little Pony super intelligent AI mashup? Yes, I am. Those things are great. And this, to me, seems a little bit odd, because if you look at things like the Star Wars Expanded Universe, this is fan fiction with publisher approval. That's all it is. And it's why people don't really consider the Expanded Universe to be canon Star Wars. Also, those other three movies that we won't talk about. <laughs> <clears throat> but if you compare that, if you compare things like Star Wars to uh, Justin Bieber fan fiction or One Direction fan fiction, or to things like Blade Runner fan fiction or Alien fan fiction, you find something which is very, very clear, that pops out very, very quickly. And that is that the fan fiction with the most stigma associated with it is written by and consumed predominantly by young women. If you have something like One Direction fan fiction, there's a lot of stigma associated with that unless you happen to be a young woman. And yet, if you go to something like Archive of Our Own and you search for One Direction, you can find more than 50,000 literary works relating to One Direction. There is a huge number of people out there writing One Direction fanfic. You'll also notice that this one here is over 850,000 words. To give you an idea, a typical novel is about 100,000 words. So we're talking about One Direction fan fiction, which is like all the Lord of the Rings, plus the Hobbit, plus the Cimmerillion, plus Lost Tales, plus some extra. This is a serious amount of writing. And because it's on AO3, it all has to be done in HTML. And that's going to be very important for my next point. If you go to YouTube and you type in JBFF, which is Justin Bieber fan fiction, you will find trailers for Justin Bieber fan fiction. These are not complete works in themselves. These are trailers to encourage you to read the works which are on justinbieberfanfiction.com or justinbieberfanfictionplus.com, which is a competing site. <laughs> and for those of you on Justin Bieber Fan Fiction Plus, I'm J Beeps Forever. Like, read my work. Anyway, you can see these. And they're incredibly well put together. These are amazingly put together trailers, um, often from footage of Justin Bieber's uh, appearances and videos and other footage which you have. These are serious works of videography and editing. And in fact, if you go looking for it, and you don't have to look very hard, you can find even One Direction video games. And they're really, really sweet. Here's Harry saying, thank you for coming into my life. And, and like, I was falling in love with this video game, and I thought it was going to be wonderful. And then Taylor Swift turned up, and she, <laughs> she tried to get in between Harry and myself. And then I had to fight her. And, and baby, now we've got bad blood. <laughs> hey. So why am I making this point? All of these things are technical skills. Writing in HTML, video editing, writing computer games, building websites to house all of these, web rings, the rest of it, they are all technical skills. And Sasha Judd, who is an amazing person who has studied fan fiction, and One Direction fan fiction in particular, did a study of fan fiction creators in the One Direction fandom space. And she asked them, have you ever considered a career in technology? And the answer, predominantly, was no. And she then asked people, why not? And the results are a little bit heartbreaking. People would say things like, oh, well, I'm tech savvy, but I'm self-taught. Or I don't think I'm good enough. Or I don't think that I'm skilled enough. And what you find is you have people with past experience in technology and video game editing and game creation and website design and front-end development and all of these things but they don't put them on their resumes. Because there's this perceived stigma around fan fiction that you don't want your Justin Bieber um, uh, uh, video game to be on your resume. 
you don't want to have those there because, hey, what if someone thinks that I'm weird because of that? And it's a really, really heartbreaking situation. Because one thing which is very, very clear is that fan fiction is part of the tech pipeline, but it's completely burst open and it's not actually getting people into technology. Fan fiction is an absolute legitimate start to a career, not just in writing, but in editing and technology and videography and all of these other things. So everybody, please, I beg you, encourage creators. Don't go poo-pooing on fan fiction. Please encourage creators. Please share the things which you enjoy. Please write good fiction, if that's the thing which you're into. And please keep sharing those My Little Pony Mad Max mashups because they are completely amazing and awesome. Everybody, thank you very much. Um, so we've got about we have, minutes. We have time for questions. We have, we have questions. On. Yeah, so Wonderful. Yep. So Do we have any questions? I should point out, if you go to the GitHub page here, github.com slash pjf slash fiction is awesome, you will have a link to everything which I've shown you into this, in this talk. There is also a copy of all the slides. There's also links to my favorite fan fiction. Um, this will have all the resources you need. Any questions? How do you deal with copyrights? Mm. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how do you deal with copyrights? Um, and this is a really, really interesting thing because it's very, very regional. So if you are in the United States, uh, which is this land of lawyers, uh, you will find that copyrights are a much, much bigger issue compared to if you're in Japan, for example. Um, so in order for copyright to be an issue, the person holding the copyright has to care. And um, if you have an author like J.K. Rowling, for example, she has been absolutely fantastic when it comes to fan fiction, where it's like, yep, if you're writing fan fiction and it's not commercial, totally cool, totally fine. Um, sometimes you'll see situations where fan fiction is being written, and it's usually when it starts to get a little bit commercial where you have problems with copyright. Um, it, the best example of that is Fifty Shades of Grey, which was originally um, uh, a Twilight fan fiction. And of course what happened there is you went through and changed all the characters. And so that meant it was no longer based on this, this other universe. Um, but it's interesting to sort of have the flip side of that. If you go to Japan, you have Dojinshi which is all of these fan-created comics and fan-created artwork, and they're very, very much celebrated as, as seen as this idea of like, you know, you can explore these relationships with these characters which you wouldn't have in the canon, which may not be possible in the canon, um, and you actually have a lot of commercialization of doujinshi as well. Uh, you have these conventions you can go to where you can buy them. Uh, you have these, they're sort of gray market dealers, um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the copyright holders are like, yeah, this is like, adding more value to our brand. This is adding people who are excited about our universe. It ends up being a good thing there. Um, and then you have things like the Star Wars Extended Universe where they can get licensed by publishers and, and, and printed. Um, so it's this very, very interesting thing. You can run afoul of copyright. Uh, if you happen to write some very popular fan fiction and the author doesn't like it, uh, then you can run afoul there. But I don't see that happening very often um, because it's, it's burning the fans and the fans are giving you money. So it's a, it's a sort of thing which you, you don't see as much as you might think. Does that answer your question? Wonderful. Any other questions? Up the back. Just, just shout, and I'll repeat the question. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if it's actually not as female dominant as it looks. And I wonder if that's a case of a survey sort of getting some of the male authors being in a very female heavy community, not women's game. Mm -hmm. so, so the question was. Um, uh, having read lots of fan fiction, uh, is it really such a female-dominated community? Um, or do you have uh, uh, male authors who are, who are trying not to stand out? Um, one thing which uh, certainly is going to influence things there is that was a study done on Archive of Our Own. And so that is a particular site which houses fan fiction, and you have a community around that. And so if you went to another fan fiction site, if you went to fanfiction.net or if you went to Justin Bieber Fan Fiction Plus or if you went to one of these other sites, you would probably find a, a different uh, composition there. 
Um, I still think, as, as I think you said, that it's almost certainly a, a non-men dominated field. Um, but I think that based upon where you go, you will find different levels of representation there. I think that the AO3 survey was anonymous. So I would hope that you wouldn't see much bias there uh, in terms of results. But I would have to go back and check to be sure. Any other questions? Uh, yes. I'm going to be that guy. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tim appears in some of my fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I do know a lot of people have actually gotten their games careers by writing mods, which have then started out as their own things, and they got picked yes. up by studios like, wow, this mod's amazing, and you got hired. Yes. Because of their mods. Um, so yes, like, and and mods. And mods are this really interesting thing because mods... So, so Tim had pointed out mods are great and people get hired because of their mods. Uh, Squad is a perfect example of this. Squad just picked up... Tim and I wrote a book on Kerbal Space Program um, along with some other people in the room who are not all here. Um, hi, John. Um, but mods is, are a very good way to get into the game industry because it's like, hey, you can show people what you're worth. Um, uh, Squad actually picked up a whole bunch of modders for Kerbal Space Program. Uh, I think eventually it ended up that the majority of developers on Kerbal Space Program came from the modding community. Um, so yes, it's a very, very good way to get into games. And whether or not mods count as fan fiction is this interesting thing. They're definitely fan works. And very often you do find mods being fan fiction, that they're adding characters into a universe or they're uh, uh, adding things into a universe, which is not necessarily canon, um, but does have some fictional elements to it. You'll see a lot of crossover between games in the modding community. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you all so very much for coming.